Hello listeners and welcome to the Monta Weekly Podcast, bringing you energy matters in an informal setting. In today's pod, we'll discuss power purchase agreements, or PPAs. To the non-expert, the exceptionally high electricity prices we see in Europe's wholesale markets would seem to suggest that companies should be rushing to sign deals for much cheaper renewable energy. But why is this not happening? One of the reasons could be uncertainty over the regulatory environment amidst a flurry of market interventions, both at the national but also at the EU level. Investors and banks don't like such insecurity. And what's the general outlook for the PPA sector? Helping me, Richard Sverson, to discuss this and much, much more is Dominique Hichier of Pexapark. A warm welcome to you, Dominique. I hope I... I hope I haven't mispronounced your name. Good afternoon, Richard. No, all good. You pronounced the name perfectly fine. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Excellent. So um, I, I think, you know, before we get into talking a little bit more in detail about market intervention and the regulatory side of things, which I know you're an expert in, Dominique. So um, I, I think if we could maybe talk about 2022 in terms of the PPA market, um, what happened there? Uh, you know, it's an exceptional year in many, many ways. Um, but what did it mean for, for, for power purchase agreements? Absolutely. So we certainly had a very dynamic um, year. What we've seen in the PPA market is really the activity of the utility PPA market going down. Um, and that's, of course, because of the highly volatile uh, market in environment um, because of the high prices uh, we've we've seen when we look at the the german futures market we've seen prices uh, they're reaching almost a thousand euros per per megawatt hour these are our levels that are really unprecedented and with that came um, a very very high volatility as as well and as a result um, of that, many utilities have reduced their activity in the in the PPA market, um, and that's because they were facing very high margin calls when they were active on the exchanges. Um, what what utility offtakers normally do is they hedge PPA volumes with um, with exchange traded products with with future products. And um, with the high volatility, this, these standard practices have become more costly and more risky. And a lot of them have, have uh, achieved their internal risk limits. So we've seen less activity from the utility of takers. On the other hand, we have still seen relatively high activity from the corporate um, of takers. So this year, the market was really driven by the corporates with almost 80% of the deals um, closed by corporates. So um, it's really corporates driving the market at the moment. And, and for corporates, as you say, PPAs were also a way to hedge um, to procure electricity cheaper than, than on the forward market. But certainly a very dynamic year. Absolutely. Um, in more ways than one. But I think, Dominique, if we can... Um... What sectors in particular were the corporates? Or was it across the board uh, a very active year? I would say it's it's really across um, the board. We also have a lot of, of new entrants, a lot of corporates who are, are signing uh, PPAs for the for the first time. And of course, we, we also have uh, still strong demand from the usual subsects, suspects um from from the tech sector um but really a bit across the board i would say and is that more of a, a desire to secure cheaper electricity than they'll get on the on the wholesale market the forward market or is it also uh the desire to 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 procure green uh energy or a combination of the both maybe absolutely both absolutely a combination of of both factors absolutely it's still very much driven by esg um, sustainability targets and corporates are, are really looking for, for additionality. So they really want to see that their PPA is, is helping um, new capacity to come online. And then have they, um, you know, have they got healthier balance sheets than the utilities or, or have they, what kind of risk profiles do they have? What, because it seems that they're, they're driving the PPA rather than, or they're more active rather than the utilities. What, what's the main reason for that? I think it's it's um, it really depends 
one thing that we've seen in the current environment is that, of course, guarantee levels for PPAs are, are going up because they are, are, are marked to, to market. So with rising um, wholesale prices, we've also seen um, yeah, guarantee levels going up. So that certainly um, represents a barrier for some corporates to, to enter the market. And what we've seen there um, this year is, is actually that governments have, have started to step in and that they have started to come up with scheme to, to help corporates um, provide the guarantees for, for PPAs. So we've seen that happening in, in Spain, in France and, and previously in Norway. So that's, that's certainly a, a very innovative way of tackling that problem of, of the high guarantees. So state-backed guarantees to, for, 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 for green energy for, for, corp, for the corporate sector. Exactly. Yeah? No, that's, that's, exactly. A, that's a very, and that's come or it's been accelerated this year, would you say? I think that has um, accelerated this year because um, the governments are, are also really seeing PPAs as a, as a way for the industry to procure electricity at, at lower prices mm -hmm. as a remedy for the crisis. Interesting. I mean, I think, where would you say the high spots were in, in 2022 in terms of markets? Where was their most activity? It, I mean, I'm talking about countries, you know, geographical areas. Absolutely. So Spain is still the front runner um, in terms of the number of, of deals uh, closed, same as, as in the past um, years. We have seen a lot of activity in, in Germany as well. So Germany is really starting to, to catch up. Um, also a lot of, of activity in, in short-term PPAs in, in Germany. So when we say short-term PPAs, we, we say um, everything below five years. And this year we've seen a lot of assets that are normally under the, the EEG, the German subsidy scheme. We've seen them opting out of the subsidy scheme and actually going for short-term um, PPAs. So the German subsidy scheme allows that flexibility, but also on the long-term PPA market, quite a lot of activity in, in Germany. And other than that, um, we've had a few uh, newcomers. We've had the first PPAs ever signed in Bulgaria, in, in Austria, in Cyprus and in Estonia. Um, and also quite a bit of, of activity in, in GB, in, in Finland, and also in Poland. And where have, been, where has, have you seen a drop-off in activity that maybe could be uh, of concern? We've seen um, a bit of a drop in offshore volumes in some of the offshore-driven um, uh, countries. That's, that's probably the most notable uh, drop, so in some of the Nordic markets. And, I mean, I'm hearing, we'll go into more detail, uh, uh, you know, in, 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 in a minute or two. But, you know, I think it, it's interesting to look ahead and think, do you think that this, this activity, that the short-term deals will also increase uh, going forward or will, will it be a combination of both short and long-term? I guess in the short to mid-term, the short-term PPAs might be slightly more affected by the revenue cap discussions. But going forward, I would absolutely expect um, the two kind of PPA types, um, so to say, to, to coexist with, with each other. And um, I think also lenders are slowly warming up to the idea um, of providing uh, project financing or debt financing um, based on, on shorter tenors. So we, we might see shorter term uh, PPAs going forward in coexistence with with the long term um PPAs. Mm, so that's that trend is likely to to continue. Um so Dominic, I mean we we we're here primarily I think to talk about what's happening in terms of uh the regulatory environment and the market interventions. We see both revenue caps and and price caps being introduced at the EU level at the, at the national level and it's quite a complex picture out there. Um, <laughs> um, both the price caps and not least for the for the revenue caps. I mean, I, I just had a closer look at some of the proposals that have both been passed, but also are being drafted in various EU countries. And and the complexity is enormous because the 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 price cap varies for for the technology, but also for for the countries. There's quite a lot of variation. 
what does this mean? I know it's a very general and open question, but what does it mean for the development of, of PPAs, uh, Dominique? That's that's a very good um, question. I believe for the long term PPAs, these will really be less affected because now we've had um, the gas prices, we have uh, we have had the power future prices um, coming down. And so have the PPA prices uh, as well. So in in some or in many markets, um, we now have long term PPA prices which are uh, which are below the cap levels. Of course, it it depends on the on the country. Uh, it depends on the level at which the the cap is is set. But in general, I think we can say that with lower prices, uh, higher chances of producers actually being below um, the cap. And then, of course, because a long term PPA contract is is typically uh, around 10 years. um, So if you look at the impact um, of the revenue cap on the entire revenues over the duration of a long term PPA, then, of course, the the impact is is uh, smaller. Short term PPAs will be um, with will be more affected. The futures market is still in in backwardation, which means that the future contracts with a delivery um, date in the in the closer future they trade at higher prices, and that then translates into um, uh, higher short term PPA prices, which means they will be more affected by by the cap. In the discussion of of the revenue caps, is there any anything that's taken you by surprise here, Dominique? I think what I was most surprised by was was really uh, kind of the patchwork of of regulations um, that we now see. So the EU regulation it had it initially proposed a cap of 180 euros per per megawatt hour, um, but then the EU regulation left a lot of freedom for member states to to customize the regulation to set lower caps. Um, to to set technology specific caps, and I guess it's really that flexibility that has uh, posed quite a bit of of problems because now we have that pack, patchwork um, with with really widely varying caps as well. We we have countries with very high caps, um, countries with very low caps, um, also very different timelines so uh, for how long these revenue caps will be in place will also be um, different from from country to to country and also the mechanisms for example how do you define and calculate the excess revenues how much of the excess revenue will be skimmed off is it all of it is it 90 percent is it 20 percent and um some countries have even opted for an entirely different type of regulation, for example, uh, Finland going for a corporate profit tax, etc. So I think it's really that, um, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that variance of regulation, which is now really massively increasing the complexity in the, in the market. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, absolutely. It must make experts like yourselves in, you put you in great demand amongst the, the, the sector there, Dominique. But, uh, um, <laughs> Could you give us a little bit of an overview of the of the, the the different approaches taken by some member states? You know, the the where where they've set some who've set it high and who's been a lot lower. Absolutely. So I think in in general, the least problematic um, regulations are are the countries which have just adopted the EU um, regulation or the EU cap and just went for a a cap of 180 euros per per megawatt hour. That has been uh, the case in in Croatia, for example, in in Czech Republic. Um, Italy will most likely also go for for that one. Um, All the countries that have opted for a corporate profit tax instead, like like Finland. Then there are um, countries like uh, Poland, uh, Romania, which have set relatively low um, caps, and in some of these countries, um, there are also still a few questions around how, for example, virtual PPAs will be um, will be treated. And then, I guess the most complex regulation is is uh, probably 
the German regulation, because here the caps are, are not only technology specific, so solar different than wind, for example, but the caps can actually even be asset specific. So you really have to, to look at the regulation in, in great um, detail. There are also a few disadvantages of uh, or for assets that are under a PPA. And what is a bit problematic is that the German regulation fails to take into account new PPAs for, for existing assets. So they would not be taxed based on, on their actual PPA revenues, but based on some market reference. Um, and that can can expose the producer to uh, yeah to to additional risk. Luckily, it's it's the new built um, assets with with new PPAs that are that are exempt from from this, um, but still of course increasing the complexity for for a bit. Mm -hmm. I was just going to ask you about the exemptions anywhere. So that's one exemption. But are there any other? exemptions in in across europe for 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 ppas is it uh, um for new build or that are part of um, an older system for example or i guess the good thing is that the eu regulation really clearly states that um the revenue cap taxation should happen based on realized revenues so if you um already have a ppa in in place um, then these these PPA revenues need to be need to be considered, because of course a lot of PPAs have been negotiated in in times of of lower prices, so producers wouldn't necessarily benefit from the high prices we we have um, today, and obviously we we cannot tax them based on revenues they they never uh, had that would be catastrophic for for the PPA. Uh, market, so that's that's really the good thing about the, the regulation. I guess virtual um, PPAs is is a special case because there there is no physical exchange of electricity. There is only the financial um, settlement between the the off taker and the producer. So a producer might actually have high revenues from his physical power sales, but he might have to pay back parts of these revenues to the off taker under the financial contract. So of course that might result in reduced losses, in reduced profits, sorry, or or, or even um, losses. And it's it's crucially important that these kind of structures are also taken into account. And actually my expectation is that um, regulations which fail to take into account the, the realized revenues or PPA revenues, that these will either be modified at some point or or that they will be legally challenged. For example, we've already seen one developer um, filing legal action regarding uh, the Romanian and the Polish regulation. So we might see a fair bit of, of litigation in, mm. in that area. Yeah, I'm d I was just going to ask, Dominika, what's been the response uh, you know, both the you know amongst developers or about amongst off takers, both on the corporate and the utility side, to, to the, this flurry of of regulation and the, this this very patchwork approach. So I think a lot of of questions really, because um, a lot of the implementation um, details are just not not clear yet. It's also important to take into account that a lot of this regulation has been put together within a very short amount of, of time. Um, so often they're, they're not 100% precise and they, yeah, there will need to be implementation guidelines um, to, to translate how these um, will be implemented. But in general, I think a lot of open questions, a lot of, of uncertainty, I think also a lot of concerns around the reporting requirements of this, because it will um, fall back on the producers mostly to to report these excess revenues to the regulator, etc. And also in terms of monitoring, um, if if you're an investor or a developer who has a large portfolio in different countries, then of course now you have to look at all the countries really in detail on a case by case basis to the reporting etc so it's um it's increasing complexity by by a fair bit yeah massively increasing the regulatory risk i'd say but um 
But I, I want to go back to what you said about the definitions here, because you, you know, we, you know, amongst ourselves on the Montel News Desk, we often wondered the the, the revenue cap uh, in terms of what it, what is an excessive uh, revenue. Uh, we thought initially it would be profit, but the, 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 this clearly states revenue. So what is actually being taxed here and what is excessive? Who defines what excessive is in this case? I think that's a really good question. Um, I think for that, it's the devil is really in the detail. So you would have to look at the regulation in each um, country. How are the revenues uh, defined? Is it just the um, the wholesale market revenues? Is it um, revenues from providing ancillary services, etc.? So you really have to look at each um, regulation in, in detail, and it's it's difficult to to make generic statements and also what is an excess revenue we've seen countries defining that um very differently in the context of of this debate so a lot of work for for <laughs> regulatory experts like yourself and also for lawyers there i think but um absolutely and i think to a certain extent it's also a bit paradoxical because we've been trying to to harmonize the power market rules in the EU for for a long time and really integrating all the power markets into one single market. And now we suddenly have this situation that the the amount of revenue you can make um, in the different markets will will vary quite a lot, or at least for a certain amount of time. Mm. So you mentioned the duration um, of the these caps. Does that also vary a lot from member state to member state? And when could we you know, the tendency is once you impose such a, uh, you know, a form of taxation, which it is, um, it's very hard to to stop that, you know, or to, you know, it's much easier to extend it rather than to, to lift it, isn't it? Absolutely. That's, that's exactly right. Um, I would say that the fact that we don't quite know how long these measures will be in place for really harms investor certainty um, even more. The EU regulation was supposed to be temporary. It was supposed to um, last until end of June this year. But now, for example, Germany is already contemplating an extension of the measure until um, April next year. So, yeah, there's there's a lot of open question. And I think another open question is, is also whether this will lead to or developers to choose contracts for difference uh, more often, so the state-backed um, financial contracts, because these assets um, are shielded from, from this regulation. And um, so the question is, will developers uh, for a while prefer um, the CFDs over going subsidy-free and, and, and looking for, for PPAs? But these are, of course, uh, open questions. And I could... I guess you could say that also the risks of having the state as a as a counterparty in a, in such a contract um, uh, have increased in the current context because there have been just so many regulatory changes and sometimes even retroactively. Mm. So you can see that that would be an attractive proposition for 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 many firms. But are you concerned that that will drive activity away from PPAs and into CFDs? Is that one of the major concerns of, of, the, of the sector? So we haven't seen that happening yet. Um, of course, it will it will depend on, on a lot of, of factors. We certainly believe that both markets will be needed. It will, it will need the PPA market as well as um, the government scheme, the CFDs to um, realize the renewables deployment that uh, that we're heading for. Um, I think in, in terms of the, the scale of the challenge, we're, we're looking really at um, adding around, I think it's, it's 80 gigawatt of solar and wind capacity annually per year by 2030 to reach the Repower EU targets. So that's of course massive. And um, to realize that that capacity, we will really need both. We will need CFDs as well as the, the PPA market going forward. Yeah, so need all the tools at our disposal. But, exactly. but have, you noti- have you noticed a sort of slowdown uh, in activity because of the regulations that have been put in place and that uh, investors and companies are 
adopting a wait and see approach until they have more visibility or more clarity we have seen that yes especially um from from september to the let's say the end of year period where it really wasn't clear how the eu regulation would be translated into national law so there we really had a period where a lot of activity came to a standstill and, and players were in the wait and see mode um, now that the regulation is, is clearer and also market players understand that the, the impact, for example, on, on long-term PBAs might actually be relatively limited, I think um, we see activity picking up uh, again. Okay. And a, a final question, really, Dominic, and talk maybe more in the medium to long-term. Um, there's a lot of uh, you know, work being done in Brussels on market design reforms. What are your expectations here in terms of the, the, for the implications for the PPA market? I think we have certainly very interesting discussions ahead of us um, for, for this year. It's, it's tricky to talk about something that we don't know a great deal about um, yet. So I think it will really depend on the concrete proposals that will be brought on the table. Some of them we, we already uh, know, some of them really aim to fundamentally change the market design that we know today, the, the marginal pricing um, system. There are, for example, proposals to, to split the markets and to have one separate market for, for what we now call the inframarginal generators, renewables, nuclear and hydro, and another market for, for the conventional um, generators. Personally, I don't think the market is, is broken, necessarily needs, needs fixing. I think the main risk that we have is that these discussions will, will end up with a uh, re-regulation um, frenzy. Um, I think we should really avoid pivoting to a situation where we move away from market-based solutions and where we're moving back to a highly regulated system, uh, again, for renewables. Because today we are in the fortunate situation that renewables are not only cost competitive with, with, um, with conventional power generation, they are now actually even the, the cheapest technology so now taking a making a step back and going back to to um highly regulated uh systems personally i don't think that will lead to the most efficient um outcome and could actually slow down the the energy transition so i think for for any proposal on on the table it will be important to uh, yeah to consider the impact on the ppa market because yeah to to really um, be successful in these these transition. We will certainly need uh, the market based approaches, and uh, we will need PPAs um, to make that happen. Absolutely, Dominic. Thank you very much for providing much needed clarity into this very complex patchwork picture. So, thank you very much for joining the Monta Weekly Podcast. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you. So, listeners, you can now follow the podcast on our own Twitter account, aptly named the Monta Weekly Podcast. Please direct message any suggestions questions or you know let us know if you if you think you have a good idea for a guest on the show you can also send us an email to podcast at montelnews.com lastly remember to keep up to date with all that's happening in energy markets on montel news you can subscribe on apple podcasts and spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from thank you and goodbye